For many centuries, we used stars to navigate. But in the last few decades, the scientists realized that there is actually something even better. Something even brighter. Something that produces the brightest light in the universe. Visible from the edge of the observable universe itself. Objects that we believe represent a super or sometimes ultra massive black hole, absorbing a huge amount of mass, producing extremely bright environments around itself, and shining with a light equivalent to thousands or even millions of times brighter than the entire Milky Way galaxy. Light that's not just visible from across the universe, but that also doesn't really change much, which means that we've learned to use them as a kind of a beacon in order to navigate, or to be more specific, in order to use these objects in various navigation systems such as GPS. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton. And today we're going to be talking about a recent study that might have solved one of the bigger mysteries in regards to ancient quasars. The mystery of how some of the first quasars in the universe might have been created and how they were able to exist, even though in theory it should not have been possible. Mostly because we don't believe such massive black holes should have existed in the early universe with such tremendous masses. But the actual observations show us that they did and that there is something in there that we just don't understand. Yet this recent study might have solved this mystery. Well, let's actually discuss this in detail because it's a mystery that's been sort of in the making for several decades now. So what exactly is the mystery? Well, some of the earlier quasars were discovered over five decades ago. And back then they basically resembled a kind of a star-like object that weren't really truly stars but were still very bright. Because of this they were known as the quasi-stellar objects, abbreviated as QSO. Eventually, this became Quasar. And with time the scientists figured out the theory behind this and how all of this worked, eventually realizing that this is basically the direct proof that black holes definitely exist and some of them can get super massive. And it was actually the early images from the Hubble Space Telescope that were finally able to pinpoint that a lot of these quasars are actually located in the center of various galaxies. And that means that the galaxies tend to produce quasars for the most part with the culprit behind all of this being the central black hole in each of these galaxies. And eventually they even found some galaxies that were interacting or even merging with those quasars appearing much brighter. And this of course made a lot of sense. As the galaxies start to interact, a lot more mass comes into the center and a lot of this mass then gets absorbed by the black hole, generating these quasars in the process. This actually pivots back to my point from the video I made about the James Webb telescope that produced the image of these two interacting galaxies you see right here and that we've discussed in that video that from a certain angle and of course during a certain period of time would appear as quasars to someone really far away. More about this in that other video in the description or somewhere right there. And so over time over a million different quasars have been discovered across the universe with all of this so far making quite a lot of sense. But then something unusual started to happen in the early 2000s. The scientists also started to discover some of the earlier quasars, with the current record holder being the quasar known as ULAS G1342 plus 0928, with many of these quasars also containing really really massive black holes. In this particular case it seems to be a black hole that's approximately 800 million masses of the sun or at least 200 times more massive than the one in the center of our own galaxy. And this sort of created a major problem because current theories do not really explain how such a massive black hole can appear in such early universe. Today we know that when a typical black hole grows in size, it generally has two opposite forces acting in unison. There is a force pushing things out as a lot of things are being emitted because of all of this radiation produced. This is what's known as the galactic wind or in some cases it can also be known as the quasar wind. And then we obviously have the force of gravity from the black hole itself that tends to attract everything and tries to basically consume it to some extent. But because of the size of the black hole, which means that they're generally quite small, most of the mass does not get absorbed and ends up going through the rest of the galaxy and even escapes into the intergalactic space. And so there are actually limits on how fast a black hole can grow in size and by using these limits we can determine that some black holes should not have been possible so early on. For example this one here seems to have appeared in the universe only 690 million years after the beginning of the universe, meaning that somehow it managed to grow super fast and became super powerful already. And though maybe that one particular galaxy could have been a fluke, since then the scientists have found more. This one is at least 1.5 billion masses of the sun, 
and it was already around 700 million years after the beginning of the Big Bang. And this one is 1.6 billion masses of the Sun, and it was around 670 million years after the beginning of the universe. And so this sort of created a problem for modern astronomy. And just as a side note, the most amount of emissions coming from various quasars around the universe, or basically the highest number of quasars in the universe, existed approximately 10 billion years ago. So basically before the solar system was even around. With time, the number of quasars decreased dramatically. And the size of black holes in all of these quasars ranged from several millions to tens of billions of solar masses. The more massive the black hole, the brighter the quasar. With some of the most powerful quasars releasing the amount of radiant energy thousands and thousands of times greater than the Milky Way itself. More intriguingly, some of the more recent studies have even identified groups of quasars that seem to create some of the largest known structures. You can actually see some of them in this list that you can also find in the description below. I think the biggest known today is the one known as Huge LQG, also known as Huge Large Quasar Group, containing 73 separate quasars that sort of look like this in the night skies. But because at least 200 quasars that are less than 1 billion years old have been discovered in the last couple of decades, nobody really understood how this was possible. But the scientists behind the recent study might have finally found an answer by basically asking a computer. They've conducted really complex and really important supercomputer calculations and simulations showing us how all of this might have been created without the use of any special physics, without the need to change anything in our formula and without breaking anything anywhere. And it all kind of makes sense. So first of all today we know that normally quasars are found in these relatively large structures filled with a lot of turbulence and a lot of activity already. Meaning that there's a lot of gas interacting and a lot of gas colliding with other gas creating larger and larger structures. Now one of the previous studies from a couple of years ago discovered that well for one it's actually possible to create a relatively massive black hole pretty much directly which can then essentially turn into a quasar as long as everything here starts with a black hole that's approximately 100,000 masses of the Sun, meaning that it's possible to create all of this from a pre-existing, somewhat massive black hole. But the question was, how do you form these massive black holes when we know that black holes generally are produced during supernova and can grow in size maybe through collisions and maybe through absorbing mass, but we don't really know of any other mechanism. Maybe it was because of excess of radiation in certain regions some unusual interaction of dark matter, or possibly some unusual gas interaction, or some other unusual interaction that we didn't understand, but that also was not observed in any of these early images where the quasars were clearly visible. So something else had to form these massive black holes right there from scratch. And all of this had to happen relatively fast, within maybe 250,000 years, in order to form a massive black hole that could then start consuming mass and grow in size further. But this new supercomputer model essentially recreated some of the formations in the early universe, discovering that by just having enough cold gas that seems to coalesce into these very dense streams, this gas is then capable of growing into relatively massive black holes right there by itself in just a few hundred million years, without the need of anything unusual or anything exotic, with the only requirement in this case being turbulence, a lot of turbulence, turbulence that you can kind of see in this video. And so because of this hectic interaction of gas and a lot of streams moving around, smashing huge masses into other huge masses, at some point you actually get these relatively large chunks of mass visible in red that create overdensity. And this overdensity eventually collapses catastrophically, creating relatively massive black holes at least 40,000 masses of the Sun. In their simulation they created one with 30,000 and one with 40,000 which can then start growing bigger and bigger as they absorb more mass and interact with more gas and more matter around them. And so, in a nutshell, what the idea here suggests is that pretty much everything here could be created in the early clouds, these primordial clouds that existed in the early universe where just huge amounts of gas was violently interacting, forming larger and larger chunks, with some chunks eventually forming massive black holes. With the paper also then explaining not just the origin of these objects, but also their demographics and how some of them ended up so close together with so many in the same region. With the only source being Turbulent Origins. Turbulent Origins of First Quasars. Quite a cool title and quite a good explanation for a mystery that's been around for a couple of decades. 
which also of course suggests that the early universe was just a lot more hectic and a lot more chaotic, but was also very likely quite inhospitable to everything around it. Which means that having stable conditions on some kind of a planet in the vicinity of these objects would be practically impossible, and that means that life in these regions would also be very unlikely to evolve either. But that's of course another story for another day, we will be exploring early life in the early universe in some of the other videos in the future. Which means that you should probably subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.